Good afternoon. This is uh, Jim Bell, President and Founder of Bell Investment Advisors, and I'm here with my, my colleague Rohan Nayak, Certified Financial Planner, uh, Portfolio Manager here at Bell, and uh, also an Investment Advisor. Uh, so thanks for joining me today, Rohan. Yep, thanks, Jim. Uh, our subject today is uh, about President Trump and the first uh, 60 days. Um, if you're, uh, you'll see a question box uh, on your screen. We invite you to submit uh, questions and uh, we promise to answer them. If we don't have time to answer them live, we will uh, get back to you quickly. Uh, and also, if you're having any technical trouble, you can call the 800 number on the bottom of your screen. And uh, you can also uh, send us a message uh, in the question box about any technical difficulties. So here's the overview of uh, what we're going to, uh, to cover today. I'm not going to read these bullet points to you, uh, but you can take a look at those. Um, I've been a, a financial advisor now for 35 years, <clears throat> and uh, never before in my career have I seen a president capture so much attention uh, from the financial markets and also from just about everywhere else. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times this month uh, speculating that uh, Trump has probably received more attention than any, anyone in history. Um, it's a, kind of a, a stunning uh, possibility. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, also, I want to make the comment that uh, at Bell Investment Advisors, uh, we are fiduciaries. We always have been since our beginning in January of 1991, uh, and uh, that that requires us to put our clients' interests first. Uh, no ifs or buts about it. And uh, in our uh, webinar today, uh, our role is to observe and interpret political policies as to their effect on our clients' investment opportunities and threats. So we are nonpartisan. We're not a political organization. We sit on the 50-yard line to make our observations, and we do not take sides. Uh, we are sticking with investments and economics today and not commenting on social issues. So uh, regarding the, uh, the Trump agenda, which the uh, financial markets have uh, put so much focus on, certainly uh, from the, the get-go uh, has been characterized as a pro-growth, uh, business-friendly opportunity in terms of his agenda. With the uh, events of uh, last Friday, um, it seems pretty clear that it was a mistake to start with something uh, so complicated and uh, divisive as uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, corporate tax reform and infrastructure, uh, should have come first. Uh, it, it just would make sense, um, and, and may, probably infrastructure is even uh, more likely to get uh, some traction uh, than corporate tax reform. Uh, it would just be good to get some legislative momentum and uh, then go on to more complicated things. Uh, there's quite a bit of bipartisan support in uh, fixing our uh, public assets. So. It appears now that would have been the best place to start, but that's that's not happening. Or we're going on to corporate tax reform, and there is bipartisan support there, but it is very complicated. Certainly the uh, issue of repatriating foreign profits held hostage offshore is, uh, is something just about everybody is concerned about, and our economy would benefit from uh, being that much, allowing that money to come back home and uh, be, be invested in, in the American economy. Uh, as regard to uh, fixing America's public assets or the infrastructure program, uh, our borrowing costs are very low right now. Uh, the 10-year U.S. Treasury is, is uh, again below 2.4 percent today. And um, with that low cost of borrowing, if we're ever going to fix uh, our physical plant in this country, this would be the time to do it because it's cheap to borrow money. But certainly not everybody agrees with that. So uh, here's the, the positive uh, Trump agenda. Um, 
uh, we've talked about corporate tax reform. Um, Goldman Sachs estimates that the S&P 500 earnings would grow by 10 percent if corporate tax rates were cut from 35 percent to 20 percent, which is one of the features that's being talked about. Uh, regulatory rollback has already begun. There's a lot that can be done there by executive orders. More complicated things like Dodd-Frank uh, in the financial sector will need uh, legislative action. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, infrastructure investment has, has not really been uh, paid much attention at this point. So that, those are all uh, those were all very positive uh, aspects of the Trump agenda, and it's it's uh, a big part of the reason why the why the confidence and uh, animal spirits have been uh, so raised in a positive way. On, on the negative side, included in some of this debate uh, are, are at least two areas, the protectionist trade war issue and uh, anti-immigration policy. So let's, let's look a little deeper at those. Uh, this is just one example, but Trump's uh, tariff threats against Mexico have devalued the peso by 10%. Uh, this is a little bit out of date now, uh, but we'll see if it sticks. When the... Uh, uh, American Health Care Act was pulled off the House floor on Friday, uh, the Mexican peso uh, ha had quite an uptick. Um, and like I said, we'll see if it holds, uh, but uh, that was taken as a sign that, uh, that, that Trump may, may not be able to do as, as much as he thought he would. Um, Trump promises to, uh, to grow exports, but exports to Mexico are declining. Um, with with the uh, peso being weaker and the U.S. dollar being stronger, it makes our uh, exports to Mexico more expensive and less competitive, so there's less demand. And uh, when we get into trade wars or tariff wars on both sides of trading, it does make the whole world smaller in that uh, there will be, there, there's less demand for, uh, for production uh, because it, uh, Prices are not no longer competitive, um, so th uh, that's a concern. Harvard economist Robert Lawrence uh, put it this way: "It makes no sense for us to make things at home if it costs less to import them. We raise living standards by sending the Chinese airplanes that we exchange for clothing. Uh, this is kind of the business model of efficiency. You you uh, provide labor and produce things." Uh, at the lowest cost and the greatest efficiency. Uh, Walmart is very much against any of this tariff uh, talk, uh, and Walmart is our largest private employer. So something to be concerned about. Next on the uh, immigration <laughs> agenda, uh, there's, there's talk now about uh, limiting the H-1B visas. Uh, these visas are for specialized uh, uh, jobs that are that that our U.S. companies want to want to fill, uh, and it's it's meant to uh, provide opportunity when the U.S. population uh, doesn't supply enough of those specialized uh, jobs, uh, and so it it, uh, it 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 certainly has made sense to open that up to the world and uh, be able to hire the best and brightest. Uh, the, the Trump administration is now talking about cutting back on those in their America First uh, agenda. Uh, just uh, uh, some more notes here. A, a 2016 study by the National Foundation for American Policy found that 51% of U.S. startups worth over a billion dollars now were founded by immigrants. And uh, we know from uh, research that all immigrants are disproportionately likely to start new businesses. Uh, the fact is that immigrants are very entrepreneurial and they start businesses and they employ people in greater proportion than we U.S. citizens do. So uh, my personal assessment is that if Trump can accomplish even half or less of his positive agenda, corporate tax reform, regulatory rollback, infrastructure investment. It's going to be very good for business. It's going to be very good for the U.S. economy. 
and uh, I, I see markets producing uh, major growth. Uh, this isn't just my point of view, it's really the consensus point of view in regard to uh, Trump's positive uh, pro-business, business-friendly actions. Uh, so finally I'm going to talk about the uh, lack of or the disunity in the Republican Party. Um, it, 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 it appears that the Republican Party is really divided into three uh, factions. Uh, first one is the Chamber of Commerce faction. Uh, this is led by Paul Ryan. Uh, he's a he's a true, uh, uh, really uh, ramped up uh, deficit hawk. Uh, he he does believe in free trade. Uh, he does want business tax breaks. Uh, he wants to reform entitlements. Uh, you know the entitlement uh, policies and. Uh, grasp on the budget or dominance of the budget it is a concern and uh, of course uh, we just saw him Ryan that is in his attempts to re repeal and replace Obamacare which uh, which failed on Friday uh, the second group are what I call the Tea Party rebels or uh, now they call themselves the freedom faction uh, these are the folks that drove uh, John Boehner out of his speakership into retirement and now they're after Paul Ryan as we saw on saw last week. Uh, these folks want tiny government. They want the US government to be as small as possible. They want no federally subsidized health care period. Uh, they're also deficit hawks. Uh, they want to bring down the debt and bring down government spending. The third faction are the Steve Bannon populace. Uh, this is this is really uh, the primary or one of the primary focuses of America First. Uh, these folks hate free trade. They don't care about deficits or debt. They care about America First. Uh, they want to spend big on highways, defense, and job training. They cannot stand Paul Ryan because he would curb entitlements, and they want to expand them. So these are the, the challenges that, uh, that Trump is, is dealing with. Uh, I don't think there are a lot of Steve Bannon populists uh, holding office in, in Congress, uh, but it, it, th that, that, fact, that faction is certainly influential in, in, the, in the White House. So putting this part in perspective, uh, it's not all about Trump. Uh, the cover of the March 18th, the Economist emphasizes the significance of America, Asia, Europe, and the emerging markets all growing at once. Uh, this is very powerful as uh, growing economies help every other economy and uh, this, is, this is a surprising but very positive uh, result right now. Um, another point here is that the American and global economies are much, much bigger than Trump. Uh, markets have been up and stable this week after the surprise of the uh, Affordable Care Act repeal failure on Friday and uh, this uh, stability and, and even uptick uh, is due to strong fundamentals in America and, and really throughout the world. So next I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on uh, Rohan here. He's going to talk about our sector analysis uh, in regard to the election and this this analysis is important uh, because we use it in our active momentum system to identify where the leadership is in the market so uh, Rohan uh, uh, you're going to start with financials so let's let's get into that yep thanks thanks Jim uh, you know now that we have discussed the the Trump agenda we want to focus on the effects we have seen in the markets since election day now, Jim mentioned this, but we'll look at how certain sectors have behaved in the last five months. Uh, this is important to us at Bell because it is a significant part of our active investment strategy, which tracks performance momentum over time. So if you look at financials, you know, banks and other financial institutions are expected to be big beneficiaries of a Trump presidency which could mean scaling back of, of post-financial crisis regulations. Uh, this includes the overhaul of Dodd-Frank Act, 
I know that's believed to have hampered uh, U.S. bank lending regulations since the crisis in 2008. Now, financials have been the best performing sector since the elections, but we want to provide an added perspective by chopping the performance into two distinct periods. So first, performance since election date until end of 2016, and second, the year-to-date performance of the sector in 2017. So here you can see the divergence in performance for financials, how much of it came from the initial rush of a Trump victory up 17% versus the momentum weakening in 2017 up 1.6% this year. I would also like to highlight the next step or pending action for sectors we discussed today. So for financials, it's the new fiduciary rule which have been worked on for last seven years and is expected to be implemented this April. Now, this rule requires providers of investment advice to abide by a fiduciary standard, you know, putting their clients' best interests best interest forward uh, before their own profits. Uh, and Jim also mentioned this earlier. So we'll just have to wait and see how and when this gets implemented. Now, technology stocks were in deep red immediately right after the election result. During his campaign, Trump frequently mentioned the tech sector being in a bubble and slammed companies, including big names like Apple, for, for manufacturing their products abroad, whether it's uh, China or Mexico, and promised to bring back their business back to the US. Now, this concern can be seen in the performance from the election date to end of 2016, with a modest gain relative to other sectors of 2.9%. Now, the, the second part of the performance, comparing it to the financials, which started strong after elections and have been slow this year, the tech sector has been the, the opposite, having the strongest start to 2017 up nearly 10%. So the pending items from, from Trump will play a big role the rest of this year. You know, he has a tough stance on immigration, which may hamper the ability of tech employers to find the, the global advanced engineers which, have, which are needed to drive innovation. The, the tech companies are heavy users of government's H-1B program. But on the other hand, Trump's promise to slash the corporate tax rate may allow some tech, tech players with massive cash holdings overseas to bring that cash back home. And that can boost spending and growth for these companies in the United States. And just a comment here, um... You know, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, of Apple, I'm sorry, made the made the comment uh, last year that uh, that they have uh, perhaps uh, trillions of dollars overseas because of our corporate tax structure. And uh, what he said, being a California company, the reason they're not bringing that money back to invest in the United States is that he would have to pay a 40% tax rate on on those dollars, uh, both uh, federal and state combined. So. That's another big issue affecting the tech sector and other sectors. Thanks, Rohan. Yeah, good point, good point, Jim. So looking ahead at uh, materials and industrials. Now these two sectors go hand in hand. Uh, engineering and construction companies are widely expected to benefit if Trump sticks to his campaign promise to make American infrastructure great again. You know, you can see here, unlike financials and tech, which had divergence in their performance when comparing these two periods, both materials and industrials have built on their strong momentum since elections in November. Both positive 6% and 8% to end 2016 and continued momentum in 2017, both up nearly 4.3%. So the, the pending popular promise from Trump has been to set the unemployed, unemployed to work repairing roads, highways, and bridges. Uh, the companies that are seen as help to build this border wall have certainly seen a climb in their performance already. For healthcare as a sector, healthcare is argued to be the most vulnerable sector given President Trump's pledge to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. 
Now, in the last two weeks, we have seen Congress attempt to pass the revised edition of this act. The, the attempt failed last Friday, to which markets had a temporary reaction. Um, this, this act passing would have left 20 million people without health insurance and ended the most popular provisions within Obamacare. Now, if you look at the performance, you can see healthcare has behaved very similar to tech with a modest return to end the year after elections, but a strong start to 2017 being up 8%. Now, something that's pending for, for this sector is, you know, regulations under the Trump presidency are expected to ease on the drug prices in contrast to promises made by Hillary Clinton during her campaign. You know, the biotech stocks are expected to benefit for the same reason with a less punishing regulatory environment. And Rohan, as we, as we talked about, it was very interesting to watch the uh, hospital stocks in particular. Uh, uh, hospitals were very threatened uh, by the Republican uh, Repeal Act. And uh, after it failed on Friday, uh, they've had uh, qu quite an upswing. So uh, the healthcare sector um, has a lot going on. Yep. So we move to the, the energy sector. So energy sector has had the largest divergence in terms of an aggressive rise soon after elections and a strong pullback to start 2017. You know, alternative energy companies, specifically solar companies, have taken a beating and are expected to be among the big losers from a Trump presidency. You know, he has promised an energy revolution with deregulation and heavy focus on traditional fossil fuel energy resources. Uh, he has pledged to revive the coal industry and is expected to roll back policies that favor renewables. So again, the performance divergence is apparent, fueled by the gradual uptick in oil price in 2016, no, no pun intended there, but heading back lower in 2017 to start the, start the year. So something that's pending within this sector, you know, Congress has posed a potential for reduction or elimination of the federal tax credits for solar insulation. And an, another comment here, Rohan, uh, it, it, it's interesting to see that, you know, one of the reasons that, uh, that oil and uh, in some respects energy in general is that there's, there's quite an inventory built up uh, in oil stocks and, and, and national gas. So there's a, there's a lot of inventory and it's not matched by by global demand at this point. So let's con continue on with uh, the consumer discretionary sector. Yeah, this, this sector and the consumer discretionary and consumer confidence is important. Uh, the consumer discretionary sector is essentially the general public going out and spending on discretionary items. This spending and sector has seen a consistent rise throughout this bull market. This is especially seen with the performance here since election date last year up four and a half percent and that momentum carrying over into 2017 up 6.7 percent. So this was further conf confirmed just yesterday with the headline news of consumer confidence reaching a 16 year high. Now this is good news and that, that news itself sent the markets higher yesterday. So this is another sector along with industrials and materials, which has had strong momentum in the last six months plus. Um, you know, with the next item for Trump and the Congress being tax reform, there is a chance tax cuts can add additional spending dollars in consumers' pockets. The, the, strong, the strong wage growth is also another positive sign for the U.S. economy, which could point to a pickup in inflation um, you know, consumer sentiment is currently the strength of U.S. economy and markets, which has been the driving force behind its performance. Now, here's a summary of, of all the sectors. We highlighted some of the stronger ones. The, the rightmost column shows which sectors have been the best performers since Election Day, uh, with financials and technology topping the chart. You saw earlier the performance comes from different periods, whether it's initially right after the elections or a, a lag after the initials, but a strong pickup in 2017. 
for us, the more notable sectors are in bold here uh, that are industrials, consumer discretionary, and materials, which have shown, uh, using our terms, the strongest momentum. They have been the most consistent, while others at the bottom of the table here have lagged or shown weaker momentum. Now, we have talked about how markets and sectors having performed well, but there are many people and investors very concerned about markets reaching their all-time highs and what is supporting this continuing performance. You know, for this, we look at the equity market valuations closely, since this is an important piece to measure. You know, the U.S. market is trading at higher levels over fair value. Now, that statement itself sounds dangerous. However, there's a big difference between high risk and immediate risk. The immediate risk is the one that's crucial. So if you look here at the trailing 12-month price-to-earnings ratio at 26, this could be a concerning figure when compared to a, its historical average of 15 and a half. The contrast to this is the forward-looking price to earnings ratio of 17. Now this is much closer to the average and we consider this an important piece of evaluating earnings and, and valuations. Now the second bullet point here, we, we also look at profits and earnings if, if they rise for to support the uptick in valuations. As long as earnings are improving, this can support the higher price of a stock or a company. So we studied Q4 or quarter four earnings of 2016. 99% of the companies have reported, completed reporting earnings. 65% of the individual companies beat the estimates, which is in line with the prior quarters, which is good news. But along with that, the really positive news is that we, had, we saw S&P 500 had a 4.9% increase in earnings year over year. This marks the first time the index has seen year-over-year -year growth in earnings for two consecutive quarters. And that, that, that's since Q4 2014, Q1 2015. So that is really good news. Now, you might be wondering why I'm pointing that out. You know, we point that out because the significance of S&P 500 profit increases means a few things. It means lower valuations for those S&P 500 companies, for those who are concerned about high valuation numbers. It suggests a positive trend for those companies to be growing its profits, and in turn, it allows the U.S. markets to have a higher chance of continuing upwards. Thank you, Rohan. So, so these are our uh, conclusions. Um, I'd, I'd like to just uh, follow on to what uh, Rohan was saying about market valuations, uh, we are seeing this, this strong trend in growth in corporate earnings. And uh, this is something that's happening all over the world. And uh, as I said before, e economies that are growing help all economies, those that are growing and those that, that may not be growing. Uh, so we're watching these valuation measures very carefully, but uh, we're not concerned. Uh, we, we see uh, momentum uh, coming our way, and uh, the fundamentals for uh, for corporate growth are very, very strong. Um, just just to look back a little bit, you may recall that uh, the start of the markets in 2017 was much better than fe uh, January, and February in in 2016, when the world was worried about a, a, a significant contraction in China. And uh, we had uh, oil inventories and prices that were dropping like a stone. Um, and that was very disruptive. And we, we got off to the, the worst start in history in, in 2016. 2017 has been much different. I think the, uh, the fact that uh, the whole world is growing together and uh, fundamentals are very strong, uh, the momentum is good. Um, we, we are uh, expecting more. U.S. interest rate increases, and uh, we see this, and we think the markets see the the Fed actions and in increasing rates as a vote of confidence that the, uh, the the U.S. economy has recovered to the point where 
uh, it's just uh, appropriate to uh, to have uh, interest rates more at uh, at market levels and not uh, artificially uh, repressed by the Federal Reserve. Um, so uh, another strong conclusion here is stay with your long term investment plan. Uh, don't react to politics. Um, in history this this is something that's never worked for investors. The important thing is that you have the appropriate investment strategy. Um, we, we advocate that that strategy should come out of your comprehensive financial plan and uh, we just encourage you to invest and don't trade. Don't try to time the market. Don't try to time uh, politics. And finally, we're using our uh, momentum signals in the sectors, as Rohan just reviewed, to help identify market leadership. So uh, we, we look forward to any uh, inquiries or questions that you might have. Uh, this, uh, if, if you'd like to get a copy of these slides, we can send them to you. This uh, webinar has been recorded. It'll be up on our website library. Uh, in, a, in about a week and uh, you can see on this slide uh, past webinars that are on our website uh, for you to review. Um, our next scheduled webinar is our investment commi uh, committee update uh, which is for uh, clients only for compliance reasons uh, and that's scheduled in June of t uh, in, coming up in June um, and if anything significant happens uh, we'll, we'll do another uh, webinar to, uh, to bring you up to date on, on uh, any actions that seem appropriate. So uh, there's lots of ways to, uh, to get in touch with us. Uh, th these are some of, some of our contact uh, information. And uh, final slide, uh, there's also uh, lots of social media on Twitter and LinkedIn and our blogs. Uh, Bonnie Bell's career and life coaching blog is very popular, and uh, we do uh, a regular finance blog as well. So there's our email address to, uh, to reach out to us and our, our phone numbers. So thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, thank you, Rohan, for your good work, and uh, we look forward to uh, talking to you in the future.